I want to read something to you here, put it on the screen. Um, this is an oath, and I want to know if anyone knows what this is. This is not the whole thing is part of it, but does anybody know what this is? Uh, never do outrageously, never murder, always flee any kind of treason. By no means be cruel, but give mercy to everyone who asks. Always treat ladies with respect. Enter no battle in a wrongful quarrel of any, for any reason or for any of the world's goods. Does anybody know what that's from? You're, you're very close. I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint. Uh, this was uh, an oath that was sworn once a year on Pentecost. And it's called the Pentecostal Oath. Does that ring any bells? This was the oath that the Knights of the Round Table took in King Arthur's presence. And... Um, I want us to think, before we, before we go to Scripture this morning, I just want us to begin to think of the significance of that. The, the, being around the king's table, being around the king's table, being invited into that, the king clearly has passions and priorities, and, and to surround himself with the select few who would make that happen out there, to represent the king's values and the king's priorities. And, and, and thinking of uh, uh, King Arthur and those knights, how seriously do you think they took that? I think very seriously. Uh, there, were, there was no qualms about that. But let's look at a different day and a different king. And, and as he surrounded himself with people who would do his work, who would pursue his passions, fulfill his purpose, uh, surrounded himself with his closest confidants who had sworn allegiance to him uh, as their Lord. To be around the king's table was a huge deal and not to be taken lightly. Well, this morning... We uh, arrive in the upper room, and if you were here last week, we started a new series uh, that will lead us up into Easter. We're going to take the four or five weeks and look at the last week of Jesus' life. And uh, so last week, we looked at the triumphal entry as Jesus rode into Jerusalem uh, on what we would normally celebrate on Palm Sunday, and the impact of that, the passion of that, we saw Jesus' priorities. And, and as he came into Jerusalem there for the Passover, today we pick the story up there, and we're going to look at when they celebrated the Passover together. And we're going to do that together too. But this, I, I, I want us to be clear that more than anything else, Jesus' last week on earth clearly defined his passions, his priorities, uh, his, uh, his purpose more than anything else. And if you go there in your Bible, we'll go in, in a few minutes. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about this, as they did last week. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's a matter of 13 to 15 verses of Scripture. John gives five pages to this. And, and, and what you'll see if you look through John is Jesus teaches so much in this context actually more than what the Sermon on the Mount was. And it's all about his highest priorities, his passion and his purpose. Next week, we'll jump into that teaching. But today, I want us to end up in the upper room here. And so, what I'd like to do, if you were here last week, I did this too. This is in um, Matthew chapter uh, 26. It's in Mark chapter 12 and 13. Oh, sorry, Mark 14, in Luke in chapter 22, and in John in chapter 13. But as all four of these uh, gentlemen wrote about it, they all put in different details, uh, different aspects of the story. John doesn't even talk about uh, the Lord's Supper in his account at all, about the meal. Uh, they all look at little different aspects of it. And so if you were here last week, what I did was I took the bits of all of them and strung them together in order and told one story. So I'd like to do that again, uh, if you'll allow me to do that. So if you're going to try to follow along in your Bible, there'll be lots of these little bits you won't see unless you're flipping pages back and forth and back and forth. 
So this is a long reading. So um, if you want, we all have that little movie projector in our head that we kind of just visualize. Just uh, as, as I read this, just uh, climb inside there and visualize this as it plays out. Uh, and let me read this for you. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus sent Peter and John, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? Jesus said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and say to the master of the house, the teacher says my time is at hand. Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he, he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Prepare it there for us all. And the disciples sent out, set out and went into the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. So during supper, Jesus rose from the table. He laid aside his outer garment, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. And Peter said, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share in me. And Peter said, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've just done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. And if I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should also should do just as I have done for you. Truly, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And it was evening, and he reclined at the table with the twelve, and as they were eating, he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the cup... After they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. It's the one who's eating with me. And they were very sorrowful. And they began to question one another, which of them could uh, it be who's going to do this? And they began to say to him, one after the other, Lord, is it me? One of his disciples, one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's he whom I will give the morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So he had dipped the morsel of bread, he gave it to Judas, and Judas answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said, You have said so. And after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, What you're going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said that to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or give something to the poor. 
So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man not to have been born. And a dispute broke out among them as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest. And Jesus said, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority uh, are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you should become the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or one who serves? It's not the one who reclines at the table, but I say it's the one who serves. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So Peter said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you'll follow me after. And Peter said, why can't I follow you now? I lay my life down for you. And Jesus said, you'll lay your life down for me? Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison or to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. And when they had sung together, he went out, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the next place, he said, pray. Next week, we'll pick it up right there. And we'll look at what they talked about between here and there, which is a lot. There's so many things in this that I want us to talk about. I wish we could take a month. We could be here till 3 o'clock. Uh, even the little things, uh, you know, just as I'm reading it, I'm thinking uh, Simon was going to betray him and Satan had come to, to the Father and, and wanted him to sift him. And what did Jesus pray? Jesus didn't pray that he would be protected from Satan's attack. He said he prayed that his faith would be strengthened, that he wouldn't lose his faith. Interesting. There's so many little things like that, but here's what I want to look at. They, they, they were celebrating the Passover together. And the Passover they celebrated every single year for generation after generation. It went all the way back to Egypt to the ten plagues and the final plague where the, um, the angel of death was going to come and kill the firstborn of everyone unless they sacrificed a lamb and took that lamb's blood and put it on the doorpost. I know many of you know this story. And the angel then, seeing the blood, would pass over. And so the blood saved them from death. That's an important factor we're going to come back to later. So they came, to, they were celebrating that as they did every single year. But this time, this time together around that table, the whole deal changed. And Jesus changed the entire thing. He pulls together all the things he taught. He pulls together the things from his life and the example and the modeling he gave them. And he gives them a brand new covenant, a, a new way, a new outlook, a new kingdom. I want us to look at three things in that from this story. Okay? Pretty simple. But three things... Uh, that Jesus talks through as they go through these things, right? The first is a brand new attitude. And we see this in the washing of the feet. Jesus, uh, in John, is the only book that talks about this one. Uh, but Jesus, uh, who is their leader, their master, their rabbi, puts the towel on and bends down and does the job that only the servant would do. A couple of interesting things as, as we look at that. Um, because they, they uh, would be, as you know, it would be dusty, and they would have sandals on, and whenever they'd come into a house, a servant would wash their feet so they're okay and they're coming in the house. Uh, it was the servant's job to do that. And here's their master doing this. You can see Peter's response. Uh, uh 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 you're not washing my... Like, that was an honor and dishonor thing. Two things that happen here simultaneously, two very different meanings to this on different levels that uh, Jesus talks about both. One in the conversation with Peter, uh, he's talking about a spiritual cleansing. 
If you've had a bath, you don't need to wash. Just the part that just got dirty, right? And, and we know that he has forgiven us. He has cleansed us from sin. He's forgiven us past, present, future. We are forgiven. We don't need to go back and do that all over again. But we know every day we sin. Every day in this country, our feet get dirty from walking in the sand. And we need to be cleaned constantly, constantly, constantly. So there's a spiritual cleansing we see there in, in John. But we also see a new attitude. And this is when, uh, starting in verse 12, I love this phrase. Jesus sits down back at his place at the table and says, Okay, did you see what I just did? And they begin to talk about it, and he starts to unpack the lesson of his intention in doing that. He's talking about the master and the servant and being greatest and the least and, 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 and saying this whole way of Jesus is upside down to everything in our world. It's a complete turnaround. This is what Jesus taught. He lived it. He modeled it. And I think it's really important to see that Jesus is talking about this around this table. Jesus is about to be arrested that night. He is around the table with his closest, with those, like, think back to Arthur, it's a dumb example, but the parallel, the King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. It's his last opportunity to talk to them, and he goes to the most important thing in that context, and it's love people. Serve humbly. That's what this means. Do you think he's really asking us when he says continue to do this to each other? Do you think he's really asking us to wash each other's feet? Or is he making an object lesson here to say, you need to get off your high horse of being served and earning respect and get down on your knees and serve the lowest of the low. Jesus says, you want to be great? In Jesus' kingdom? You want to be great in his kingdom? Then serve. Serve. Two quick stories. Uh, took a, a group of, of high school students one time to Nicaragua. And one of the things that we did, we visited a jail. Jails there are not like they are here. And this was one of the most disgusting places I've ever been in my life. A really small uh, cement room. It was cold. It was damp. There was mold and mildew, and it was dripping water constantly. There was a little slat about three inches across the, the ceiling of the room that let sunlight in. Other than that, it was completely dark. There was no toilets in there, and the room was maybe, I'm going to say, 10 by 14, and there was at least 12 guys in there. It was absolutely disgusting, and we took a group of teenage guys in there, and we visited and we, we washed them, and we cleaned in that room. They deserved to be there. But we didn't. Another example, we, we took a group of students to Jamaica, and we were working at a little public school, and we painted the whole thing inside and out, and fixed up their grounds and all that kind of stuff, and played with the kids. And uh, the first day that we were starting work there, uh, I got all the kids together and we started divvying out all the jobs that had to happen. And there was cleaning here and there was scraping paint there and there was raking and, and all these kind of things. And I hadn't thought through it very well. And so I start divvying out jobs to everybody and there was me and a kid named Mark left. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh, the only job left is the latrine. Mark and I went off to start cleaning the latrine, which was probably worse than that jail. Halfway through, we were probably in there for about an hour, kept going out to gasp for air and come back in and clean this. And then all of a sudden, Mark said, you know what? He said, it's not so bad that you and me get to do this. I said, what? <laughs> he said, you know what? This is where Jesus would start. You see what Jesus was saying here? This, this whole thing is upside down. It's different. You want to be great in his kingdom? Then take the lowest job. Take the dirtiest. Take the grossest. Take the stuff that really is beneath me. And start serving people there. 
It's funny, in Luke chapter 22, verse 24, in this story, as it goes through chronologically, if they've just finished their meal together, they start a conversation. In Luke chapter 22, it says, they started a discussion amongst themselves about who would be the greatest. They've just done this. Jesus has just talked about this. Then they ate together, and then the argument breaks out of, I'm greater, I'm going to be greater, I'm going to... Can you, just, can you just see Jesus' frustration? This new kingdom, this new covenant, this new attitude, this new, this new outlook on life, this new perspective is completely upside down to our world. And in this kingdom, we don't think that way, Jesus is saying. It's not about being served. It's about being served. If you want to live in this kingdom, if you want to be around this table, then that's not going to happen here. Look at all the things that Jesus said as he taught and lived uh, his ministry about, uh, about his kingdom being upside down. Right? We did that a few months ago, and we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, and we called it the upside down kingdom. But look at all the different things. Love your enemies. Right? Give away your coat. Go visit the lepers. Others first. You can go on and on and on. It's upside down. This, this new attitude, this new perspective, this new outlook on life is completely upside down. You can see that, right? Jesus is calling for something new. I think he's saying, if you're going to sit at my table, here's the deal. Remember when I asked you, we were talking about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table at the beginning. I said, do you think, how serious do you think they were? So Jesus takes this new attitude then and this new outlook and connects it directly to a new commandment. Now they all knew the commandments. The Ten Commandments, they would have lived by them. That would be their code of honor in a sense. And in John chapter 13... Starting verse 34, as he breaks out this story, he starts talking about this new attitude, and he simplifies it. And Jesus says, so here, let me simplify it for you. We roll it up into one little ball. He says, love each other. That's how people are going to know that you're mine. That's how people are going to know you're around this table, by your love for one another. Two things I want to talk about that really quickly. One, the word love. You know, as you know, it was originally written in Greek, and there's multiple words in, the, in, in Greek language for love. And there are different levels of love. This one here, Jesus says, is agape love. This is the highest level of love. The, the no strings attached, no holds barred, the reckless love that, that it doesn't matter what you do or who you are or what you've done or what you do to me. I will love you like God loves and that's how he's saying we should be loving because that's how people are going to know you're a disciple. The other thing here is the word one another. It doesn't mean within this, these walls we love each other. So we're followers of Christ. We're around this table. We love each other and everyone will know. It's not what he's saying. That word for love one another there basically means, means duplicate. The way I loved you, love others. Duplicate my love in you. Duplicate it. That's how they will know. So this week, I uh, got, a, got a text message from uh, one of the dads who was here on Wednesday who had dropped his youth group kid off. And he, they live in Owen Sound, so he stays here usually. And this week he was sitting in the lobby while youth group was happening. And someone came walking in the, the front door who was drunk and... Um, uh, looking for some help, looking for one of the pastors. And so um, this, this dad that was here uh, sat him down. They talked for probably half an hour. They prayed together. He, got, he called a taxi, paid for the taxi, and sent the guy home. But what that man had told him when he came in the door is he had been hitchhiking on the highway. And whoever picked him up, and I don't know who it was, it was one of you, thank you, somebody picked him up and drove him to the church. Didn't drive him home, drove him to the church and said, if you go in here, they will help you. Think about that. If it was one of us, 
that we know what happens, right? But what if it was somebody from our community who just picked them up and dropped them off here because they know we're going to help him? So this guy, um, I think he got him something to eat. They talked for a while. They prayed together. He got him a taxi, and he left. And you know what? That's not the pastor's job. It's our job. It's to love, to serve the lowest to all, to show that agape love. And so Jesus then says here in this new covenant, this new way, do this every month. Do this every time you're together. Do this whenever you do this, whenever you eat together. Remind yourself of this. I don't think he's saying remind yourself that Jesus died on the cross and your, forgives are, your sins are forgiven. This is way bigger than that. Way bigger than that. And then he seals it with the new covenant. So we have a new attitude and a new commandment, and it's sealed in a new covenant. Now, a covenant is just simply an agreement, but I love the other parallel definition. It's not just an agreement. We shake hands and we agree that this is going to be the deal. Because the word covenant means disposition. This is who I am now. This is my disposition this is my character. And, and that word covenant is like a will or a testament. Actually, it's funny because the word covenant, if you, if you have a King James Bible and you're looking at that, uh, it says, when Jesus says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, in the King James Version, he says, this cup is a new testament in my blood. And something I didn't know until this week when I figured this out. The word covenant and the word testament is the same word. It's not variations on the same. It is the same word. So think about this. The Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. It is living in and understanding God, connecting with God in the Old Covenant. That's what it is. Why do they call it the Old Testament instead of the Old Covenant? The New Testament is the New Covenant. Every word of the New Testament is the New Covenant. It's our oath we take if we live in Christ. And so Jesus uh, says to them, here's a New Covenant. Here's the deal between God and you. Here's what it looks like. Here's the deal. And, and so Luke 22, verse 20, that's where he says, this cup is a New Covenant in my blood. Here's the new deal. And he's inviting the disciples in. Here's the new way. Here's the new outlook. Here's the new attitudes. Here's the new covenant, the new testament. Here's the new kingdom. Are you in? Because it's this. It's not just this. Now let's talk about Judas for a second. Because Judas is in the middle of this story too. And I want us to see that Judas is at the table. And it says in John that the others had no idea about Judas and the betrayal and all that kind of stuff. They, even after Judas left, they didn't, it, they didn't know. And I want to think about that because that's important. Judas is at the table, right? He's at the king's table. And um, all the times as they did ministry and Jesus sent the disciples out in twos to cast out demons and heal the sick, Judas was part of that. And if he was the one who couldn't pray and heal, if he was the one who demons laughed at, every disciple would have known by now. He was every part, every bit a part of every ministry all the way along, and here he is sitting at the king's table, and in the middle of the meal, he gets up and leaves, because he's saying, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not in. I'm not in. He had already had the deal with the Pharisees struck, and he's sitting around that table. Do you think he was uncomfortable? And then halfway through the meal, he leaves. Now, I want, I want to, I, I've shown you this before, I'm sure. I want to clarify some things. It was not a long table like we see in the paintings. This would have been a U-shaped table. Culturally, uh, that's what they would have done. And very specific seating arrangement. I want to talk about three of those, because... Uh, Jesus, who would have been the host of this meal and leading this, he would have had the second 
spot on the one edge. Right? You can see that there on the middle on this side. So the host would be there. On the host's right-hand side would be his most intimate friend. This is the closest of the closest best friend forever. That was John. Okay? Now understand the way they would see. They're not sitting at a table. Right? It's a low table. They recline at the table, which means they're laying down. They would be laying on their left-hand side on their elbow, free to eat with their right-hand side. Their feet would be back. And some believe that they were laying like that when Jesus went around and washed their, their feet. We don't know that. But, but what would happen is you're laying like this with, on your elbow and your head is in the bosom of the person beside you. So John... Who, the, who he calls all the way through the book, the one Jesus loved, would be sitting on the end with his head right in the chest of Jesus. Make sense? So the, on the other side of Jesus is that place, the third place on the left of the host is reserved. That's the seat of honor. That's the one to be most honored in the group. And through history and through scholarship and some of the things that are written here and the way it's written, uh, they believe that Judas is the one that's sitting there. Think about that. That Jesus invited Judas that night to have the seat of honor. That would be the one place that Jesus would be leaning into with his head on Judas's bosom. And so it says there in, in um, John chapter 13, Verse 26 and 27, Jesus says, it's the one I dip it in and share the bread with. That happened with the person beside you. And so they believe Judas was right there. So Jesus dipped and gave it to him. And if you want to rewind all the way back to the book of Ruth, they talk about that. And that action of dipping and sharing was reserved for special friendship. It was a thing of honor for your special friend. I think what Jesus is doing here, all the way through this, he's giving Judas every opportunity to buy in, to lean in, to extend the hand of friendship and love. And Judas couldn't do it. He couldn't be there. Let me ask this question again. What does it mean to sit at the king's table? What does it mean to sit at the king's table with his covenant, with his oath, to be of one mind, Jesus walked. Everything about Jesus, his life, his death, his passions, his, his priorities, his purpose, uh, his example, his teaching, at this moment around this table with what they're doing, Jesus is inviting them to say, saying, are you in? And isn't it interesting that that's the moment when Judas leaves. And it just simply says, and it was night. I wonder if that has two meanings as well. Because it was night, because it was evening. But it was night for Judas, spiritually. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have, cruci I have been crucified with Christ, yet I am still alive. <laughs> But the life I now live, I live for him who died for me. That is what the new covenant is. Because it's everything Jesus is, everything Jesus taught, everything in his heart and his passions and his priorities and his purpose. It's inviting you around that table and saying, yes, I'm in. This is the new covenant. It's every word of the New Testament. It's the new covenant. Everything, every, every, the new way, the new promise, the new hope, the new passions, the new priorities, the new purpose, the new oath, the new way of connecting with God. This is the new covenant. Every month, we invite you to the Lord's table. Every month, it's an opportunity to be invited by him to his table. And I hope that I've done an okay job in the last half hour explaining what that means. So let's do that. Let's walk through this together. Let's share this together. Um, servers, if you would 
get yourselves ready at the back. Musicians, if you'll join me on the stage, I would like us to, to take just a few minutes and let's, uh, let's share this together. But let's think and let's be honest with ourselves about what this is. On the night before his crucifixion, they were celebrating the Passover meal. God's rescue of Israel from the Egyptian slavery. And Jesus took the elements of that meal, the bread and the wine, and he began to explain how this would become about his life-transforming uh, sacrifice on the cross. That it would be, from now on, a remembrance of him and his work, not the night in Egypt. So Jesus took the bread and the wine and changed the focus, but not the principle. The bread was no longer the unleavened bread of that night and in Egypt. It was now represented Jesus' body that would be broken. And Jesus saying clearly that he is the ultimate Passover lamb. In Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus says he, it says he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. And then the wine was the picture of the lamb's blood that, that was put on the doorposts in the Passover. And now Jesus is saying that same thing, but it would be his blood that shed for now for the forgiveness of sins. And he took the cup and blessed it and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. See, the, the, the Jewish disciples understood that. They knew Passover. They knew uh, that the, the lamb caused the angel of death to pass over the Israelites and they were rescued from death. And anyone now that identifies with the blood of Jesus would be passed over from death again in a different way. And that judgment would be passed over. That night, would have blown their minds. In just a second, the servers will, will hand out the bread, and, and uh, I just want to say, as it comes, stop and think. Stop and think of all of this, what this means. This is embracing more than, I believe, Jesus died on the cross. Because this is embracing that, that whole new covenant, covenant and if you accept that, the new attitude, the new passions, the new perspective that comes along with making him Lord, then by all means take that bread and hold on to it and we'll eat together. So if you could serve now, let's do that. You know, the, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, all the way through the New Testament, there are, very, there are two very parallel ways of explaining the body of Christ what that means. One of them is this, the church. This is the body of Christ. And he's inviting you into that. And by partaking of this, we're saying, count me in on the body of Christ. But just as importantly, it's Jesus' physical body that was hung on the cross and was pierced and killed so that the ransom is paid for us. That we could stand before God, blameless and pure, in God's eyes, because of what Jesus did. That is the body of Christ. And so in all of this, in, in all of this new covenant, in all of what the body of Christ means, are you in? Then if you are, then let's partake together. In just a second, we'll receive the cup. And this is the cup of the new covenant for forgiveness and cleansing. It's a blood-bought covenant between you and Jesus. He says this is the new covenant, the new testament, the new outlook, the new way, the new oath is bought and paid for by the blood. And that starts with the forgiveness that is necessary so that we can be in a relationship with God. So as this is passed out again, let me just say pause and think. Think of all of this means as we hold it in our hand. And if I drink this, what am I saying? He's saying, I'm in. 
count me in. Folks, Jesus was all in. Are we? Let's go ahead and serve the cup. What we're holding in our hand is representative of the entire Bible. It's called the thin red line that goes through God's story from the very beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation and the blood. And everything before Jesus points to the moment when he was, his blood was shed. And everything after that points to the moment of his blood being shed and what that means for us. If you think of a king writing a letter and then sealing it with wax and his ring imprint, this is his letter to you sealed with his blood for the purification and forgiveness of sins. The new covenant, the new testament, and every bit that is contained in that is represented in this. Am I in? Am I all in? Then let's partake together. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Whatever our level of understanding is, we thank you. You have invited us into your most intimate place to sit at your table. The honor and the privilege and the gift that none of us deserve to sit at your table. None of us can earn a spot. It's all because of Jesus. Would you remind us of that this week? In many of our situations, that we are in on this covenant, that we are forgiven, we are cleansed, we have a brand new start because of Jesus, and that our life is lived bound to this new covenant in Jesus' way. This is the good news. This is the beginning of life. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me give you one last thought. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table took their oath every year. And in a sense, we are reminded in taking this oath every month when we do this. I hope you can see Jesus' intense passion in this. What is his highest passion? His highest passion is that you can stand in the face of God, pure and blameless and right. That you would know God and be restored in that relationship. That is his highest passion. And he said, don't forget this. Do this whenever you are together. And then Jesus, at that point in the book of John, starts, uh, in John's perspective, his most significant chunk of teaching about what this means and what this looks like, what life in this covenant means. And if you're here next week, we're going to try to go through all of that in simplicity. Amen.